Although I titled this, you know, purpose, meaning, and freedom, right? Normally people think about startups as being about money. We're going to make lots of money. You know, sometimes you make lots of money. Uh, but you always have a chance to make meaning, purpose, and absolute freedom. Right? Money, maybe you're, you know, maybe not. And so then, the question is, do you have a purpose? And does it go down? Yes, it does go down. So I always start with this slide when I give talks because it's uh, a slide that I love. It's a phrase that I love called the meaning. And if you go to a guy named Guy Kawasaki, who's an Apple evangelist, so he was with Apple way back when, he gives talks, you can go on the internet and YouTube him, and he'll talk about this phrase, make meaning which is you're doing a startup because you have something that you want to achieve which is beyond a simple thing like I want to make a lot of money. That's not a good reason to do a startup. You can make money doing lots of things, right? But for our lives, for our purpose in our lives, to have meaning in our lives, to actually do something that's worthwhile, you don't start companies to make money. You start it because you have a mission, something that you want to, something bigger that you want to achieve. So what is your purpose, for example, for being here? What's your purpose for being a student? Do you have have you internalized that? Do you have a meaning for your life? Why are you engineers? You're either B, M, E, or E, C. Is anybody not an engineer? So I sat where you sat. I came here when I was 19, a small town south of Winnipeg called Winkler. I spent 11 years here getting my master's PhD, as you said. Right. Why did we do it? Yeah, we need a job. Well, I started, right? There are bigger things in life. Why? Why are we doing engineering? Because we change the world? Is that the reason? Because we get to make the world in our image? Yes, that is what it is. Right? Other people do, other designers do, but not like engineers. The world is a technological world. It's filled with technology, and technology revolutionizes the way people live the way people work, the way they play, what they do for a living, right? And that's engineers doing that. That's not, I know architects are good, I've got friends who are architects. No, not necessarily all architects. It's not uh, other people. Engineers are intimately connected with where the world is going. And this is what I would like to tell you. So I started a company called Cabresa. C-U-B-R-E-S-A is how it's spelled. Right? You might wonder what a funny name. Yeah, you try to find a unique name when you do a startup, right? And uh, I was searching for a while. So, and the reason, the purpose behind the company is because I've got enough background in medical imaging. And I've got a mother-in-law who's got breast cancer. So those two things combine, right? So the CU came from the word customized. The B-R-E-S is from breast, and the A is Latin female, right? Latin female names end in A. And that's what I want to add that on, so to break something. And so I didn't start it to make money, right? I started to do better medical imaging, improve medical imaging for breast cancer detection, and whatever else I could do, compared to one and so on. I went sideways a little bit, right? Because sometimes things don't go always as you as you want them to, or as you think they should. Uh, and so you pivot, right? You do different things. But at that so I'd like to ask you, how do you like our world, right? We've made it, we're engineers, we should take responsibility for it. I'll talk about a few things that are bigger than money and startups and stuff. How do we do so far, right? You guys are young, you're into your careers. You're gonna have your chance when you exit here to make things the way you want them to be made, right? I am old, right? Many years of a PhD, and if you look around this room, can anybody find something that is not man-made or man-invented? Right, this stuff, is this wood? Any guesses? This thing? That's some type of plastic, right? That's some type of plastic wood. The metal, it's probably a patent around the metal and the way that's processed. What is that, steel? Any mechanical, sir? Aluminum? Some type of fancy metal? Probably, right? Is there anything in this room that's not engineered made? Right? Somebody that studied at a place like this made this stuff. The answer is no, everything. There's no, there's no, right? So if you divide the world into God-given and man-given, right? There's no created world here, right? There's no plant. There was a plant that I love 
plants in my garden, but there's no plants in here. Everything is made by us. So the question you need to ask yourself as you think about your studies and your career and so on is, do you like it? And do you want it this way? Is there something you want to change? Right? This has to do with purpose and meaning. And certainly you've got the freedom to do it in your life, to make the world in your image. Startups are like that. Right? People start companies because they want to change something, they want to make something better, they want to do something beyond having a job. Right? Typically it's, it's difficult to do a startup. So I'd like to discuss five topics or discuss my thoughts about these things in five topics. So dystopia, 1776 plug wash. Anybody know what plug wash is? Is there anybody who knows who has ever heard of plug wash? It's a town in Nova Scotia. Like what, what do I mean when I say plug wash? Nobody? Okay. You will after this. And then we'll talk about money a little bit. And we'll talk about value. Warren Buffett, you might know that name, famous investor. Price is what you pay and value is what you get. Uh, and it's a maxim that can be used for startups as well. Dystopia. And this image is from, uh, and I love the movie, right? Blade Runner, 2049. I like both of them. I mean, the second one was good too. Right? Dystopian future, right? We're, we're saturated with it. There's a dystopian future in our future. And all of you guys are going to have a terrible life. Because the world is going downhill, uh, pollution is going to take over, everybody will die, all that terrible stuff that you hear all the time, right? I heard that stuff 40 years ago, right? From 60 now. Well, none of you are 20 maybe, but I mean, you get the point. 35 years ago, whatever age you are. I heard all that stuff. I heard that stuff when I was in grade three in 1976 or 74. All the same things. Uh, at that time, in 1974, it was famine. All of India would, would die of starvation, and all of China. There was no way to feed all the people. There's too many people. Does it sound familiar? Right? The dystopian future, which they're, we're always being told, right? And of course, it didn't happen. Why? Because somebody, these were plant scientists, I guess, created a green revolution, which created enough productivity in agriculture, and more land was done such that people, uh, the famine uh, has gone down. So this dystopian future that we're constantly being fed, uh, I find it fascinating. First of all, because we're fed this news all the time. Secondly, uh, because why would we do it? And I'm, and I'm saying we, because we're the engineers that are, like, what is that dystopian future? That's an engineered dystopian future uh, that is, that is uh, put up there. For some reason, somebody wanted to create a world that was horrible. Like, why would we do that? We wouldn't, right? Nobody here would do that on purpose. We might do it accidentally. I'll talk about plug wash in a moment. We might do it accidentally. We didn't know we were doing it, but we accidentally bumbled into it. Yes, that is possible. We have to be aware. But nobody does it on purpose, right? And I, I found this funny, right? We have a tendency to create some. Human beings have this tendency to create the horrible thing that they do. How about utopia? How many utopias have you seen? How many utopian visions have you seen? There's a lot of dystopian uh, movies. There's probably a few utopian movies. Can anybody name one? I, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Great New World. Great New World? That is utopians. That is dystopian. Brave New World talked about that in chemical dependencies and uh, what was it, alphas and betas and so on. 1984, Brave New World, I got the mix up. Right? But yeah, that was, that was a dystopian, would be called a dystopian. Right? Utopian would be a good place, someplace which is fantastic. Right? Canada, the very best of Canada. I remember talking to you, meeting a couple from Moldova. Anybody here from Moldova? Moldova is beside Ukraine, sandwiched in between Romania and Ukraine. It's a little country, a little sliver of country. And these people came from Moldova. They stayed in Canada for six months and they went back to Moldova for six months. And they said the difference between the countries is you come to Canada and everybody's smiling and happy. And you're smiling and happy when you're here. And then you go back to Moldova and people are very uh, 
It's a hard life. They're not happy. He said, that's the difference, right? This is a fantastic life. So there you got some utopias. Thomas More, you know Thomas More from the 1500s, wrote a book called Utopia. He said everybody would study, and this will be, you know, you can read Utopia. He said everybody would study six hours a day or eight hours a day, and then they socialized together. That was his utopian vision. The middle one there, in that, in that building, everybody's working hard at the university. The left side is the green utopia, right? Some kind of uh, place. Notice there's no people involved, right? It's the way it was. You know, Garden of Eden type utopia. And that picture there is from Tianjin. <clears throat> Tianjin is um, the south of Beijing. I spent a lot of time in China. I started a joint venture in China. And one of the things that you will find as you start companies, and as you work for companies, is that China is a more and more powerful force, both from the consumer side, the money side, investment side, startup side. And so I've spent a lot of time in China over the last two years. Uh, and getting to know China. So I've been there, I'm there about 25-30% of my time. So that is, a, that is a utopian city vision from uh, Tianjin, which is South of Asia. Of course, there's a lot of people in Tianjin. I, what would be your utopian size? <clears throat> a, little bit of, a little bit of audience participation required now. What is your utopian city size? So Winnipeg is 700,000 roughly. That place is 25 million. So you have a smaller town. In preparation, I googled, you know, optimal city size. Some people say a million. That's a common number. All right. So how many of you are, uh, are favoring cities bigger than a million? You won't okay, Gary in the back. Wow. And you live out of town. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And how many of you like, you know, would like a much smaller city? Half a million, lower than half a million? Yeah, really. That's what they say in China. There's so many people in China, they're sick of it too, right? Any Chinese here from China? Mainland China? I do. Hey, I am. So yes, the Chinese tell me, there's too many people here. And I say, yeah, but you live here. This is a picture I put in, um, in Shanghai. So Shanghai, you got the Yangtze River just to the north of it there, and then there's a channel called the, uh, I forgot the name of it, I think it's the uh, And this is a picture from Shanghai looking at the other side of the river, which is Pudong. And when you're standing there looking at it, it looks, I mean, the picture's great, but when you're standing there looking at it, it's unbelievable, right? It's like, you know, we come from Canada. Canada is a very small place. You know, Shanghai is 20 million or 25 or whatever. But you're looking at Pudong there, and those buildings, some of them are in the clouds, right? It is, it is awe-inspiring, it really is. Uh, and when you, I've stayed in Pudong a few times, because I like Pudong. Anyway, behind those big buildings is a, uh, is a nice park system. It's, it's not all, you know, it's not all terrible, it's green. Uh, the air is quite good. Maybe that's utopia, but that's a 25 million person utopia. For most of you, of course, because you like smaller cities, you would call that a dystopia, right? Too many people. It's something we create and something that uh, is a question of what do we do? And as you know, population is a big issue. So utopia, dystopian future, we need, to, we need to build one of these things. I'm assuming all of us want to build utopia. And we only do dystopia because we didn't know what we were doing. 1776, super big date, super important date in history, not because of the American Revolution, but because of what happened in 1776. Economics, things, economic thing happened. Adam Smith, he wrote a book called The Wealth and Poverty of Nations. And he said, what is it that makes some nations wealthy and some nations poor? Remember, this was before the Industrial Revolution. It's very interesting. And he was looking at this one example that, uh, it's a very thick book, I admit I have not read the whole thing, but it is fact that it is. So the one example he used was uh, making matches, or no, making toothpicks. It sounds ridiculous, making toothpicks. It was a toothpick factory. He went to visit this toothpick factory. But they made more toothpicks than anybody else, and they offered a great low price, and they cost a lot. So it was that to do a specialization of the factory, this toothpick factory. It was back in 1776. It's a funny story. 
toothpicks would be the you know, technology leader of something. So imagine that you could go from today back to 1776. All right, so Adam Smith wrote the book in 1776, but you're going to land in France, the richest person in the world at that time. King Louis the 16th, I looked it up, it is the 16th, it's not the 15th, it is the 16th, and he was the last guy before the French Revolution. So it's him and Marie Antoinette, uh, I don't know whether that's their real visages. And so you get to go back, and he asks about our world. Utopian, dystopian, whatever. Yes, how is it, right? And you tell them about stuff. Cars, phones, trains, planes, healthcare, plumbing. Plumbing's a big one, right? Technology house for health, uh, for uh, life. Tell them about all this stuff. All this stuff that we got. And of course he says, how did it happen? Because he quickly realizes, and you can read a book, uh, I think it is in the book Rational Optimist by, uh, by Matt Ridley. Right. So we are wealthier than the King of France was. He was the wealthiest guy back in 1776. Wealthiest guy in the world. At least in Europe. So all of us are wealthier than he is, or than he was. We have better access to health care, better access to food, better access to clothes. We've got more uh, travel abilities. We're better, right? We can talk on the phone. He couldn't make all this stuff. So it's a big one. How, how do you, and let's just look at the Western world. So Europe is 500 million, Mexico, Canada, uh, US is another five. Let's say it's a billion people. It's a billion people live in a certain way that is. If you take the eastern eastern part of China, Shanghai, they're, they're just as modern as when they go war. How do all those people live richer than the King of France in 1776? How is it possible? That's a good question. Because if you can't answer it, are you creating a utopian future, dystopian? Where, where are we going, right? What happened? Such that this, this fantastic growth in, and it's not just wealth, it is the, the ability, I can see somebody wants to come in, but she doesn't want to bake. I can just, <laughs> just coming in. It's okay, come on in. You'll have to bake next time, apparently. But. Human beings. Yeah, you know, you yeah. Right, so I'm, I'm very intrigued by it. How did we get here? What was the, what was the combination of events? Was it technology? Like, was it the rise of, of the science uh, capability and the, and the development of engineering? As you know, we've looked at companies like Siemens, for example. Siemens started around 1850. Uh, I'm not sure how many technology companies were earlier than that because I haven't done the study. But as a, as a, let's call it as a country, we should probably understand how we got here. And, and try to do it more if, if we agree that we are moving in the right direction. Right? Uh, some people would say we've gone over the top and that we're moving you know, down. I wouldn't say so we're still, we're still getting better. And I give you, if you want to read stuff there, you can read The Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley. You can look back at Julian Simon and Paul, Paul Ehrlich in their bet from the 1970s, which relates to what I studied when I was a teenager. Uh, Green Revolution of the 70s. Of course, you can go back to Matthew Small, the guys that talk about population being a terrible thing which will kill all of us as we run over food, right? That argument is 200 years old. But it would be important, I think, for us to figure out how we got here. That does have something to do with startups, by the way, I believe. So, startups, as you may know, uh, create all the jobs in Canada on average. Right, so you've got big companies. Big companies aren't very great jobs, right? Their, their revenue is plateauing, and they are trying to reduce costs and find ways to optimize costs. Right, so they don't create that many jobs. If you look at where jobs are created, it's a small and mid-sized company and a startup. Startups you can define as the first two years. Let's be more general. Let's just define it as the first uh, 10 years, let's say, of a small company's life. But that's where the jobs are created. Somehow we've got enough employment, enough wealth, enough cycle of of, uh, of goods that we can create a world for ourselves where all of us are richer than the King of France. Think about it. It's unbelievable. What does China want to do? China was a socialist country. Go back to the 1930s. They apparently want, want what we've got, right? Because they moved towards a uh, market economy. So that's 
one, what's one hint? Something to do with market-based economy, something to do with uh, the creation of uh, small companies, something to do with uh, letting people have decision-making power over their lives instead of everything coming from a centralized source. Those are all good hints as to what happened between 1776 and now. So there's dystopia, there's where we were in 1776. There is, there is a, you know, a famous dystopian admission. So this is Pugwash. There was a, there was a, a rich guy, uh, Cyrus Eaton, who grew up in Pugwash, Nova Scotia. He went to the US and made a lot of money. And I guess he knew a few of the scientists that had worked on the, uh, on the bomb. And these scientists were expressing terrible, terrible remorse at what they had done. You know the famous uh, Oppenheimer's famous phrase, I have become death? Which Oppenheimer was that? It wasn't Louis Oppenheimer, that was an investor. Oppenheimer that worked on the bomb. So after the bomb went off <clears throat> in 44 or 45, after the bombing of Japan, and after the bombing of Japan, He's got a very famous quote, you can look it up online, and it's something like, uh, I have become death, I have become the killer of worlds, or the destroyer of worlds. Right? It comes from the, from the Indian Vedic uh, sources. So he was terribly, terribly remorseful of what he had done. He had created a dystopian bomb that was used against people. And you know, apparently he didn't, uh, for all the guys who created the bomb, you know, We're not all happy about it. So a bunch of them got together in Pudwash and started talking about how do we control this monster. I think it was 54, 57. So it's called the Pudwash Conferences. How do we control, like what is the ethical control required because of this horrible technology that we have unleashed on the world? As you know sometimes, right? It's like Pandora's box. Out it comes, you can't stick it back in because the knowledge is out. And this was a scientific thing. This wasn't necessarily engineers being involved in uh, the remorsefulness. This was, this, these were scientists who had created this horrible thing. Of course, there were engineers involved. Anytime you build something, there's engineering involved. And this was multi-country, multi right? Soviet Union, Russia, Canada, USA, and the rest. <clears throat> Got some plywood information there. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip this. How old am I? Yeah. I'm, I'm so old, right, that I remember when there was no color TV and stuff like that. Okay. So that was Pugwash. Let's move and talk a bit about money. So we'll move now to more of a startup. <coughs> every country, every, you know, the world is a pyramid of money. People are rich at the top and, you know, not so rich at the bottom. And you want to you know, you're somewhere in that mixture and you want to move upwards in some way. Building assets, getting dividends, not living paycheck to paycheck. Lucky for you, we are very mobile in Canada. You can start a startup and move up in that, in that chain. When you think about innovation and the types of innovations that you'll think about, uh, Clayton Christensen is a writer on startups and about innovation. And he talks about two types of innovation. One is sustaining innovation, and one is disruptive innovation. As you probably know, the top of the pyramid does not want to disrupt anything because they're the guys making the money. So that is sustaining innovation is what they typically do. That's why startups are so disruptive. There are newcomers into the market and they do something which is totally upsetting the current order of things. So you take Uber and Lyft and all they call the taxi disruption that is happening. That's a classic example. Uh, you think of uh, Tesla and the electric car. Why is it happening in California? You guys don't want it in Detroit or that, that whole ecosystem, that whole car ecosystem of Detroit. They don't want to get upset. Right? Disruption is coming from California. And so on. You'll notice this all over. So as you think about your startups, you're going to think about some great thing in the future that you want to do that is going to be great for the world and good because it has meaning and purpose which aligns with your meaning and purpose in life and it's going to be disruptive probably in some way because if you sustain the current order there's no room for you because you're
figuring out there now what's going to happen to disrupt something. And this is why venture capitalists always look for disruptive innovation. Um, you probably know this, but I mean, Canada is quite good at social mobility, which is if, you, if you're making this much money down over here, yes, there's a higher probability that you can make more money later on. In places like the USA, it's harder to move up the chain. There's measurements of these things, right? How, how fast people can move through income levels. USA not so good. Canada is pretty good. Apparently, Denmark is really good. Okay, and I'll give you a little bit of synopsis of uh, events in my life. Just to, uh, you can ask questions, right? Feel free to ask questions, but I'll, I'll go through some some stuff from when I was sitting here back in 1979, starting in 1979. Well, in this building, of course, because the building wasn't here. It wasn't, you know, everything was older. So this is the NASDAQ Composite Index history. Uh, during my time as an engineer, as I, as I started studying, I, I remember clearly something called local area network. This was a new thing. We have to research it. What is a local area network? Is it going to be a big thing? And I remember before there were computers, right? So I was in grade 10. And we had a, a card punching system at the school I was at, which direct linked to the U of M here. And you could, for about half an hour a day, card punch, right? So you end up with a big, you know, big stack of cards that your software's on, right? Holes punched into the, and you didn't want to drop them because if you drop them, they're all over the place. Does anybody else remember this? Other than you? There he is. <laughs> so U of M had this. I think you remember this story. U of M had a building where you would go. There was one building that had a computer, one building. And it was a big building. It was much bigger than this room. And so there would be a long, uh, over on this side, there would be a bunch of, of machines that you would type holes into the computer, or holes into the paper with. The paper was about this big, thin thing. And you would have a stack of paper this long. That was your computer program. You, had, you guys heard about this? Yeah? Anyway, you could so you would put your computer program in a box, and you had to carry it in a box because you didn't want to drop it. And if you dropped it, the cards weren't numbered automatically. So you, you would have uh, 200 cards, and if, you, if they fell, they were completely out of sync. You'd have to redo a bunch of stuff. So there'd be a long line of people, and you'd give your, over here there was a, a person whose job was to take the computer cards and put them into the, into the computer. There's a reader, a card reader over here. And the printer was over there by the back by the back door. That's how big the system was. So you put it in here, he'd, he'd run it through the reader, there'd be a bunch of stuff happening, you'd walk around and you'd wait over there for your printout to see if you know one plus one equals two, right? So one plus one plus two is the short total, you know. Hello world, right? These kind of things. Between only three people in this room. What's no, that? but you're talking about Gary, you and me? Is that it? Yeah. And maybe yeah. Susan. Yeah. Oh, it was, yeah, it was quite something. And so the transition, when I was in third year, anybody here in third year? No? No third years? When I was in third year, there was a transition that there would be a terminal that you could go to, and you could type in directly into the terminal. Right? Huge thing, you didn't have to go stand in the line anymore with the card so. That's this curve, this NASDAQ composite curve. So that was 1980. Over here, 1980. Uh, and 1982 was when, was when engineering got these, these terminals that you could sit down at. And like the next year, we got like 10 terminals. It was a huge throughput issue, right? Because now people could soft, start writing software much quicker and start learning much quicker. That's where I was, right? So when you think about startups, when you think about your career, right, and you put money, uh, meaning, purpose, and uh, other things on it, you know, the big, the big thing over here was I met my wife in 1985. That was my, my, my uh, big thing. I was going to master still. Got married before I finished my PhD. Of course, you get married before you finish your PhD. What happens? The father-in-law, you know, complains you don't have a job. So my father-in-law was complaining I didn't have a job. So I had.
had to go get a job, and then I had to finish the PhD at night. Uh, so I'd work eight hours, and I'd come here and do simulations and stuff until about midnight or one, and you go home, and you do it, and that was like six months of that. But we had a daughter on the way already, so the daughter was born, and we had a house all kinds of stuff. I finished the PhD, daughter two came, you know, those are the big events early on. Yeah, I love I loved school, but uh, when you start comparing different parts of your life and what's important and what's not, you know, you'll realize later on some things are important other things aren't. So the important things are people, always. Okay? So off we went. Two daughters and a wife, job two, job three, got laid off. But this job three, and I was always a startup guy, right? I started in, when I was 25, I tried to get a business running here while I was a student. Me and a guy named James White. Remember James White? Me and a guy named James White tried to run a, uh, our office in Masters was downstairs on the first, on the, on the basement floor, the laser lab. So we tried to run a laser testing facility uh, over there. With the blessings of our prof, right? We were terrible business people, so it didn't happen. Anyway, job three, I got a job at a startup. There's eight people. It's called Broadband Networks. And uh, that was after Unisys, because job two was a big, you know, uh, big multinational Unisys corporation with sites all over the world. And for that one, I was the project manager, and I would go down to the U.S. But for that third job, I was eight people. And they were, they weren't in a garage, but they were in the next thing to a garage, like just above. We had an office above an old curling rink, and it was dingy. Uh, but those eight people grew into 250 people, and Broadband Networks was one of the companies early on in the wireless. We haven't hit the wireless thing well, and so we got bought by Nortel for a huge amount of money. And that, and that went into job four, which was Nortel which led into the venture capital. As the guy that I worked for made a lot of money, so he wanted to start a venture capital company in Winnipeg and did that. Um, and we were part of this huge, this huge surge, this huge boom in NASDAQ. That peak over there. Uh, in your career, you may be fortunate enough to go through a peak like that, when everything is, is, everything is perfect and you think that it is, you're being told it's utopia and the world is awash in money and uh, usually when that happens don't believe it because it's gonna, you're going to hit the downside, the other side of that huge spike. Uh, but we went through that huge spike. We were running a venture capital company in Winnipeg at that time. We did a lot of startup work with, with many different types of technologies. And I was a technology guy so I would always go in the first six months to eight months and go from, we'd find two guys in the garage and we would scale them up into an office and hire people with them and get them going to their first customer, and then I'd do it again, right? So I did a bunch of, a bunch of those activities. But by the time the dot-com boom happened and we went back down, I decided enough of that, I'm going to go on my own finally and, uh, and uh, do something myself. So I consulted. I went back to work for a company called Imbrus here in Winnipeg, a medical device uh, maker. That company ended up going public on the TSX and the NASDAQ, but I had left by then because I spent two years and I left to go out and I started my own company called The Brace, uh, which I'm still doing. Uh, and that company, as I told you, right, the initial impetus was breast cancer, breast cancer imaging. And we're currently we've pivoted to do a brain imaging device for a whole bunch of reasons, which we can you know, chat about if you're interested. But that's been the course of my career over, let's say, 40 years. When I was 19 to now, uh, through university, through all the different things, you hopefully will have a similar, fantastic, interesting career. The things that you will remember will be not so much the cool work, but the people that you work with, and the extreme, uh, the extreme challenge that sometimes you got, and the uh, success that you had together, the good teams, and that that's what will help you later on, because as you grow and as you go through your career and you meet people and so on, those people come along with you over a long period of time. So some of the people I work with now, we've worked with 20 years already in different things. So think about your career in terms of building network, building team, uh, being a good team member, and uh, learning how to work together.
you will hopefully have, as I say, you'll have all those same great things like working for yourself or others. I would recommend to start a life if you like freedom and meaning and purpose. You do get to have that, for sure. It's not always true that you'll get money. Money is harder. And oftentimes you'll, you know, you will have heard that you can start a company and get a huge investment and life is fantastic, right? Typically it's hard. Like it's hard work. Uh, and stressful. But you are doing something that you love and that you believe in. And that part is good. The way I ran my career was always if I woke up in the morning and didn't want to go to the place I was going, I knew there was a problem. Because your heart has to be in it all the time. 100%. Sometimes you get tired, right? You travel a lot and you get tired yourself. But if you get up in the morning and your heart says, I wish I didn't have to do this, because it's it, it, it's not in line with my ethics, it's not in line with my morals, I don't believe in what I'm doing, I don't think the product is helping people. If you say that to yourself, I would recommend don't do it. Find a way out. Because it's not worth it. Right? It's not worth it in life. It makes you unhappy. I do believe in balance. It's a funny, it's an interesting thing, you know, it's so Chinese. Emma, close your ears for a minute. <laughs> So when you go to China, all the Chinese will tell you that they work super hard. They're the hardest working people around. And I've, I've worked with various Chinese over the years. Chinese people. Um, but the place we, that, that I go to now is called Hafei. Nope, none of you have ever heard of it probably. Hafei is a, is a city inland from Shanghai. So I land in Shanghai, take the metro for an hour to get to the train station. So you're still inside the 20 million persons, right? And then off you go on a, on a super fast train for two hours and then you get to the city of Hafei. And in Hafei, it's, it's, you know, it's a bit like Winnipeg. I mean, you're not in Toronto anymore. You're in a more laid back place. So they don't work that hard. First time I went there, uh, they have a siesta thing that they do. They actually take a nap in the afternoon. Like after lunch, they have a nap for an hour. I didn't realize it got so hot. It gets 42 degrees in the sun, so I can see why they do it. I would call it siesta, they just said it was a little nap. But I was surprised, I've never been in a place that nap before. They have cots in the offices and they'll take a little sleep. So I tell them that they don't work so hard, but they say, oh no, we do work hard, right? Because we work in the evenings and I can you know, show me, but anyway. I don't believe in, in, um, in 12, 14 hours a day. I don't think it's healthy for people and I don't think at least a long-term productivity. Sometimes you have to do it on a spike. In any company, in any you know, when you're doing your, your, your uh, studies and you're getting ready for tests and so on. But in general, I am an eight hour a day guy. I think that's more than enough for all of us to achieve not just money, but freedom, purpose, meaning other things in life that are important. PhD student. What's that? It was in when you were PhD student. No, in PhD, I did. Yes, that was hard. Yeah, a lot of work. But so these guys also, should work all to for people. <laughs> she had the mother in love, that's the problem. What's that? She had the mother in love. Oh no, the mother in law was good. She never no. said the father in law was the bad <laughs> But even before that, I'm sure during his uh, studies, he worked 12 hours a day. Yeah, yeah Don't get it it's different. So the, and it is interesting, right? So when you, when you see these startups in California or wherever, they're playing ping pong during the day and they're really all. Right? And it's quite an environment, right? It's like, a student, it's like a student environment. They all come in from all over the place. Uh, it's more of a student field, less of a business field. And there's a lot of social stuff that they do, which is not work, but which is part of the environment. Right? You go to Google. I've never been to Google. I don't know if any of you have. You go to Google in California. It's a campus. There's a cafeteria, and there's a place to play ping pong, or there's a place to do this other thing. You take yoga during the day, whatever you do. So there's a lot of those things mixed in. And then somebody's going to come and tell me they work 12 hours a day. I did an hour of yoga, I played ping pong for a bit, I was having a cafeteria, and then I worked eight hours. Right? So I'm talking about work, even working eight hours, very hard to do. If you've got a document in front of you trying to work eight hours, it's hard. How many lines of code does the average Microsoft software person create per day? Any software people here? Lines of code coming out of Microsoft, the average guy. You know what? What would be your guess for a number? I'm going to put you on the spot. Eight. Eight, Eight lines of code a day. That's 
on average, right? When you take in, they have to do requirements, they have to do requirements gathering, they do meetings, they got bug fixing, there's all that stuff that it averages up to eight lines of code. And that's a real number, right? Okay, 1776, you put all that stuff together, it's still weird and stuff. Like, where are we? Where are we in the technology world? At Snowden, you guys, you guys know at Snowden, right? You know about at Snowden. You've seen stuff about at Snowden. Does that worry you? So when I go to China, right? Interesting story on YouTube. I, I, I don't know the person, but the person working in Shenzhen, which is like their hardware capital, and he jaywalked across the street. This is a European, really an Australian guy. He jaywalked across the street. And then he heard his phone ping, and he had a dollar taken out of his bank account for jaywalking. So when Jay walked across the street, they, some camera somewhere recognized his face, knew his bank account, and pinged him a dollar. That doesn't scare you, right? By the way, that's not normal. You know, being in a free and open society, that's not true. Uh, I don't know if Canada's moving in that direction, or the USA. But if you listen to Ed Snowden, right, everything is. Everything was recorded, all your, all your phone, emails, everything is recorded. I would call that troubling. What type of dystopia are we creating? You got Julian Assange and those problems, right? You're up on Julian Assange. Eight, eight years in the Ecuadorian thing and embassy in London. We're telling the truth, right? So this, this troubles me. This is not a good word. When you when you can't tell the truth anymore, right? That is not good. And you know, if, it, if, if technology was not involved, I would say it's not our problem, maybe. But we are going to have a Pugwash 2.0 realization as engineers, right? Scientists had Pugwash 1 when they built the bomb, right? So we are having Pugwash 2.0 shortly, I believe. And it's not going to come from Winnipeg, it's going to come out of Silicon Valley. So there's a very famous Silicon Valley venture capital guy, Roger McNamara, I think his name is. And last year he talked a little bit about this problem of technology and about uh, the change that's come over his mind. He was an early investor in Facebook. Um, and he said, we used to believe that technology was goodness. Some of you may have grown up with that idea. Technology is goodness. And he said it's not true. We've gone, we've gone past something. And we need to uh, we need to correct the problem. Technology is not goodness anymore. Things like Facebook and so on, user interfaces can be built for um, for uh, with design purposes which uh, habituate people into habits that they should not do. So I will give you a Winnipeg challenge. Uh, by the way, you can ask questions about startups and stuff. But I'd like to give you a Winnipeg challenge, which is, what Winnipeg are we building? How can Winnipeg be made better? What products, services, what could you do? For those of you interested in startups, startups are exciting to do, because you're going to do something new. You're going to make the world better. And you're going to be excited about it, because it's within the purpose and meaning of your life. Doesn't come out of here, right? Comes out of here. Startup is out of your heart. Where you say, I want to make the world a better place, and I'm going to do it doing this, whatever that thing is. So, what is, but in order to do that, you got to have a vision for somewhere that you want the world to go. Where should we? Where should we take the world? We're engineers. We do. This does. This is us, by the way, right? Engineers are developing technologies which change the world. Some of you, hopefully in your careers, will get a chance to change the world with what you what you create out of your brains. Where should we where should we take it? So that is what uh, I would like to leave you. Something I think about all the time in my company. We are making the world's best brain imager. It's called Brain Pet. It's a pet machine. So pet is positron emission tomography which means you put radioactivity into a person in specific parts of their brain, either you're looking at Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or brain cancers or whatever, and you image their guy's brain, the person's brain, with as much 
spatial resolution and sensitivity as possible to create uh, an image which a doctor can use to assess disease. Either you're trying to detect disease, or you're monitoring a therapy, or you're looking at the outcome of surgery, and it was a fantastic brain image. We're trying to make the best in the world that's ever been made. So we're excited about it, and it's going to be great, and hopefully it's going to do great things in doctors' hands. So that's my vision of the world. A better person.